Each year when I set up our nativity scenes, I'm always at a loss as to where to place the angel. Do I place it directly behind Mary and Joseph and the baby as if watching over what's happening right there? Or should I place the angel on some shelf across the room because really the angel showed up, spoke to the shepherds, and then flew away? What do I do with the angel? I'm not the first to struggle with uh, what to do with angels. In some ways, the subject of angels is, as theologian Millard Erickson says, the most unusual and difficult of all of theology. One reason we struggle with angels is that while there are abundant references to angels in the Bible, they're not very helpful for developing an understanding of angels. When they are mentioned, it's always in order to inform us further about who God is or what God is doing or how God is doing it. Most of what we know about angels is inferred or gleaned from Scripture rather than specifically stated. And so because of these challenges throughout the centuries, Christians have handled the subject of angels known as angelology in all kinds of different ways. Some have given angels a status something like divinity. Others have uh, developed understandings far beyond what we can ascertain about angels from Scripture even. While still others have tried to just simply explain them away or ignore them and say they don't exist. The story has actually been told of how the first Russian cosmonaut, Yuri Gagarin, was instructed by Soviet Premier Khrushchev that as he blasted off into space in 1962, Khrushchev said, watch out for angels. Well, on his return, Gagarin reported that he had seen no angels, and Khrushchev is said to have replied, Good, I knew you wouldn't. There are no such things. So, do angels exist? If so, what do they do? What do I do with the angel? Matthew and Luke, who give us both of the stories of Christmas, both of those Gospel writers mention the role of angels in the nativity story. In fact, the angels are heavily involved. Angels appear to individuals like Zechariah and Joseph and Mary, and they have a rather large display to those shepherds out in Bethlehem. You can't miss the angels, but what do you do with them? I suppose it's this struggle that has caused me to wait so long in my ministry career to actually preach a Christmas series focused on the angelic presence in the nativity. In 17 Christmases as a pastor, I've preached the Christmas story from all kinds of angles, but never the angle of the angels. I've preached the Christmas story on Zechariah, Elizabeth, Mary, Joseph, the shepherds, the wise men, even skip to the end and preach on Simeon and Anna, or skip to the very, very back Old Testament beginning of the prophets, but never the angels. Well, they've been there. I've mentioned them because you can't preach Christmas without mentioning the angels. But I've never considered the story from the angel's angle. Those of you who were here prior to 2012, which really isn't that many of you anymore because a lot of them are in the ground and in heaven. But you may remember three dramatic monologue Christmas series that I did back then. Um, one was on uh, the wise, one of the wise men, one was on uh, a prophet, and one was as Joseph. Uh, the series on Joseph, which I called The Forgotten Father of Christmas, was probably my favorite because that was my first Christmas here. Uh, it was a season of change. We had just moved into our house two or three weeks before. Uh, Zach was born exactly three days before the series started. Uh, I graduated with my Ph.D. a week after the series started, but the culmination of it all was the last Sunday when I took my 18-day-old little bitty son and was able to sing little Yeshua to him as Joseph to my own little baby Jesus, and be looking for that to reappear on Facebook sometime this week. Um, it, was a, it was a wonderful memory, and, and even all those years ago when I was kind of doing those kind of series, as I, I thought about doing a dramatic monologue series as an angel 
from the nativity story. But the challenge was how to pull it off. I can play a dad as Joseph. I can play a preacher, a prophet. I can even play a wise guy. But how do I play an angel? And really the costume was my hang-up. I didn't want to come out and like with a cheesy, you know, just get a baptism gown from upstairs and come down and be an angel. I, I didn't want to wear some, you know, tacky garland halo. I didn't want to spray paint myself gold and throw glitter in my hair for sure. So how was I going to pull this off? Well, this year I just finally felt like this was the year to do it. And so next week you will meet the messenger. We're going with a modern day angel. The graphic gives you a hint. Instead of a robe, I'm going with a, a white suit. Now, it's way too Benny Hinn for me. But it's better than glitter and a halo. So when, when real angels appear, you know, and you see these angels appear in Scripture, they are uh, often so glorious that the people are overwhelmed when they see them. I'm fairly certain you're going to be underwhelmed when you see the messenger next week. But, but just, just figure that he's holding back so as not to slay you all with his glory and brilliance. But as a way of preparing for this series that's going to be in dramatic monologue, so that means when I'm preaching, it's going to be as that character, much as if you were watching a play, and then I'll go back, and we'll sing, you'll sing a couple of songs, and I'll come back and kind of wrap it up as myself at the end of the message. But as a way of preparing for that, I wanted to spend time this morning talking about the background of angels, and specifically focusing on their role in the advent of Christ. You know, ad, ad, angels feature prominently in all of the Christmas stories, not just the Christmas story of the Bible. We love angels. Perhaps the most famous is the classic movie, It's a Wonderful Life. I'm not going to embarrass you and say, raise your hand if you haven't seen It's a Wonderful Life. But if you haven't, I'm about to blow the movie for you right now. But it's your own fault because it plays like 25,000 times every Christmas. Well, It's a Wonderful Life features the angel Clarence who has struggled to get his wings but through working with Jeremy Stewart, Mr. Uh, George Bailey, Clarence gets his wings, resulting in that classic line towards the end of the movie stated by six-year-old Zuzu who's in her daddy's arms and he bumps the tree and the bell rings and she says, look, daddy, teacher says, every time a bell rings, an angel gets its wings. That's not true theology, <laughs> but it's cute. Now, there are dozens of other more stories and movies featuring angels at Christmas. Just turn on Hallmark Lifetime, any of them, they'll take care of that for you. But such interest in angels reminds us of our need to understand the truth about angels and go back to the original story. I mean, does an angel get his wings when the bell rings? Are there really... Female angels, girl, girl. Actually, in Scripture, no girl angels, interestingly. But most of ours are rather feminine. So therefore, we go back to that question. What do I do with the angel? While I'm still not quite sure where to stick the angel in our nativity scenes, I do know some truth about that. And I hope that today's message will inform us about angels and encourage us to live life knowing that they are around and they are active. The Bible stresses the reality of angels and underlines their constant, even if unseen, work on behalf of God's people. In most cases, angels work behind the scenes or on a different realm in order to impact this particular realm. However, sometimes they are seen. When angels are seen by Humans in Scripture, they have a human-like appearance, except when they're seen in visions, such as looking at eschatological end times times, and then they get a little freaky looking with, with these amazing pictures up in heaven. But when a human is seen an angel here on earth, they typically have a human-like appearance. And at times they appear in radiant glory, that's unmistakably heaven in origin as when Gabriel appears to Zechariah or to Mary in Luke 1. However, at other times when they appear, they can be mistaken for humans. In fact, it's possible 
that we encounter angels at, our, at, at times in our lives doing the work of God, maybe on our behalf, and we never know it. Hebrews 13 verse 2 speaks to that. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing, some people have entertained angels without knowing it. In his book called Angels, Billy Graham recounts a story from Reader's Digest that, that recounts that a celebrated uh, Philadelphia neurologist had gone to bed after an, an extremely exhausting day and suddenly he was awakened to his door by someone knocking loudly on it. Opening the door, he found a little girl who was poorly dressed, deeply upset, and she told the neurologist that her mother was very sick, and she asked him if he could please come to her house and, and see her. Well, it was bitterly cold and snowy that night, and the doctor was bone tired, but he followed the little girl to the house. He went inside. He, he met with the mother he uh, got her medical treatment after finding out that she was desperately ill with pneumonia. And then he said to her, Ma'am, I'm, I'm really impressed with the intelligence and the persistence of your daughter to come and get me and to lead me back home. And the woman looked at him strangely and she said, Sir, my, my daughter died a month ago. In fact, her coat and shoes are in the closet right there. And so the doctor went over, he opened the closet, and sure enough, there was the same coat in the same shoes he had seen on the little girl that had led him to that house. But they were much too warm and dry to have left on anyone and come. Billy Graham asked the question, could the doctor have been called in the hour of desperate need by an angel who appeared in this woman's young daughter? There certainly seems to be no other explanation. So whether their work is visible or invisible, the work of angels is real. As revealed in Scripture, this work fills at least three primary roles. Depending on who you read and how you study, you can divide these up into many different kind of categories, but just three seems to capture most of it. One of the most frequent roles is the worship of God in heaven. If you've been in the study on Wednesday nights that we've been going through Revelation, we have seen some amazing worship experiences by the angels in heaven around the throne of God. But such worship appears at other places in the Bible, such as the Psalms and in the book of Job. But this worship role, while it usually takes place in heaven in scriptures, there's at least one place where that worship comes down to earth. And wouldn't you know, it's in the Christmas story in Luke chapter 2. In Luke 2, the sky fills with the angels above the pastures of Bethlehem and the shepherds see and hear the angelic host saying, glory to God in the highest. It's angelic worship. It's a wonderful scene. We've tried to capture that scene in songs and in hymns and in dramatic displays, and I'm fairly certain all of those fall far short of what that glory would have been like. And I'll be talking about that moment as the messenger on December 22nd. But in Scripture, not only do angels fulfill the role of worship of God, but they also fulfill a role of ministry to believers. One of the major roles of their ministry is protection of believers. Perhaps no text on angelic ministry of protection is as encouraging as the last half of Psalm 91. If you'll turn in your Bible there to Psalm 91 verses 9 through 16, just because it's a longer passage, we're not going to exegete it this morning, but I want you to, to read it and, and know it's there because it's an encouraging passage. It says, If you make the Most High your dwelling, even the Lord who is my refuge, then no harm will befall you, no disaster will come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread upon the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He'll call upon me, and I will answer him. I'll be with him in trouble. I'll deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Now, God is the hero of Psalm 91. But notice, one of the ways God does his work is commanding his angels concerning us to guard us in our ways in verse 11. Uh, John Patton 
was a missionary in New Hebrides, in the New Hebrides Islands. And one night, hostile natives uh, surrounded the mission and their home, and they were intent on burning down the home and, and killing the Pattons and, and getting rid of these missionaries. Well, Patton and his wife, during that terror-filled night, just hunkered down, knelt down in prayer, and they prayed that God would deliver them. Well, when the sun rose the next morning, the would-be attackers left. Uh, about a year later, the chief of that tribe was converted to Christ. And Patton, remembering that night, asked the chief, he said, Chief, about a year ago, you and your people surrounded the mission and were wanting to burn it down and to kill us. What changed your mind that night? The king replied in surprise. He said, who were all those men that you had standing guard around the mission? Patton knew nobody was present but him. But the chief said he was a prey to attack because he had seen hundreds of big men in shining garments with drawn swords circling the mission. I suspect, I suspect this, this protective ministry around us happens a lot of times in our lives far more than we realize. Those coincidences that just happened, the way we just missed some kind of accident, the way something finally just came together that we needed could very well be God working through his messengers. The protective role of angels bleeds over into the fact that angels execute judgment on the enemies of God. The book of Revelation is especially full of uh, prophecies regarding the judgment of the enemies of God. And the angels have a major role in that in the end time. However, the angelic ministry role is not limited to protection. That ministry role also helps meet spiritual needs of God's people. They rejoice at our conversion. You know that? When somebody comes to faith in Christ, there's a party in heaven. Luke 15, 10, there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. That's why we clap. That's why we celebrate. Because the angels are rejoicing. Somebody gets saved, we won't say, amen. No, it's greater than LSU stomping Texas A&M or Auburn beating Alabama. We celebrate what happened, right? It's good. Well, after our salvation, though, the angels don't just, you know, dunk and chunk us. They follow with us. They watch over our lives. They are present within the church. Angels are present when we worship. Scripture talks about them building a, a throne for God. I love the song because it's true. We're standing on holy ground, and I know that there are angels all around Angels play a role in taking believers to heaven when they die. In Luke 16, 22, where Jesus is telling the story of the rich man and Lazarus, Jesus says the angels carried the beggar Lazarus to Abraham's side. Many of us have been present at the time of the death of a loved one who we know walked with the Lord, who we know loved the Lord. And there are sometimes events in those last moments that we can't explain except by some kind of heavenly presence in the room. This guiding and ministry role of angels is also present in the Christmas story. You may remember that an angel gives Joseph guidance when he's unsure about whether or not he should marry Mary. Uh, the angel's protective ministry is also evident when an angel tells Joseph to flee to Egypt to escape King Herod's, Herod's murderous rampage. The angels worship God. They minister to believers. But also one of the most important roles, perhaps the most important role, but maybe the most untalked about role, is the role of communicating God's message to his people. In fact, their name, angel, comes from this Role. The Bible was written in three languages. The Old Testament was primarily written in Hebrew, but a little bit of Aramaic, and then the New Testament in Greek. The, the primary Hebrew word for angel is a word, malak. The primary word for angel in Greek is angelos. Obviously, that's where we get angel from. The basic meaning of both of those words in Hebrew and in Greek is messenger. And certainly, these words can sometimes refer to human messengers 
or an angel, and we determine which is meant by context where it's used. But since the name for these creatures is connected to the word messenger in the original biblical languages, we know that serving as messenger is a primary role. Otherwise, we would call them something that meant protector or worshiper or something else. But we call them angels, which means messenger. No place is the title and this role of messenger clearer than in the Christmas stories. Out of some 273 times angels are mentioned in the Bible, the four chapters of Christmas narratives, two in Matthew and two in Luke, are chocked full of angelic work. Almost all of it fulfilling the role of a messenger. In the incarnation, God came down to earth. And whenever God moves toward man in an event of first magnitude, and, an, and it will include a visitation of these angelic hosts. In the Christmas narratives, God's heavenly messengers deliver instructions to the lead characters, letting them know their role, letting them know what to do next. No angel figures more prominently in the story than the angel Gabriel. In fact, it's Gabriel's work that the messenger series is patterned after. Gabriel is one of only three named angels in all of Scripture. The other two are Michael, who is the archangel and usually appears in some kind of battle kind of scene. And then there's Lucifer, the fallen angel who we call Satan now. Gabriel's name means God's hero, Gabriel, or the mighty one, or God is great. And that certainly captures the message that he is sharing. Each time Gabriel is mentioned in Scripture, we see him act as a messenger to impart wisdom or a special announcement from God. Gabriel is the messenger of God's mercy, of God's promise. He specifically appears four times in Scriptures. Always bearing good news. Twice he appears in the Old Testament book of Daniel. And then twice he appears in the gospel of Luke. We first meet Gabriel way back there in the Old Testament book of Daniel. Some 500 years before Christ was born. And Gabriel appears to Daniel in order to explain some visions that God gave Daniel about end times. And then in Luke's gospel we see Gabriel's work in really up-close fashion. He specifically appears to John the Baptist's dad, Zechariah, to herald the news that Zechariah's wife, Elizabeth, is going to have a child that's going to be called John. He also appears to Mary to let her know that she's going to give birth to the Son of God and help her to understand how that's going to happen. And then additionally, some scholars suggest that the unnamed messenger who features prominently in both Matthew and Luke could very well also be Gabriel. This is the angel who, unnamed though, appears to Joseph in a dream in Matthew. He's the angel who appears to the shepherds along with the other heavenly host, but it's this angel that speaks to the shepherds. And there's also the angel unnamed who encourages Joseph and Mary to flee to Egypt to escape Herod's murderous rampage in the book of Matthew. Now, whether this angel is Gabriel or not is unsure. However, that's how I'm going to take it as we develop this series over the next three weeks. So over the next three weeks, we're going to look at three events in the Nativity. The Annunciation to Mary by Gabriel, Joseph's dream and the encouragement that was given him, and then the declaration of Christ's birth to the shepherds. The announcements of Gabriel in unfolding the plans and purposes and the promises of God are of monumental importance in the nativity story. Big things were happening. God was doing something new. And the messenger delivered the news to his people. So what? So what? Why do this series? Well, throughout history, God's heavenly messengers have encouraged, sustained, lifted the spirits of people. They have turned around hopeless situations. They have continually delivered the message of God's people that says all is well because God is in control. I don't know what you may be going through this Christmas, but I do know this. God has a message for you. 
I don't know what God has planned for your future, but I do know this. God has a message for you. I don't know how God's going to answer that prayer that you've been praying, but I do know this. God has a message for you. The message God has for you may not be delivered through an angel, but it will be delivered. Always be listening for the word from God. He will deliver it in his time and in his way. And wouldn't that be a wonderful gift for this Christmas season? Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the work that you do, God, in so many ways. Sometimes through the power of your Holy Spirit. Sometimes through the help of your angels. Sometimes through our fellow believers. But God, you're always at work. Lord, in those moments when we think you're not, remind us that you are. Lord, whatever message we may be waiting on this year, I pray that you would deliver that message in a clear and decisive way. I pray, God, your blessings over this series, that the The way that it will be presented a little bit differently will help us to see the story in a new way and to be able to connect with your advent in a fresh and a new way this Christmas season. We thank you, Lord, for your love and for your grace and even your presence right here, right now. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.